Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to a sale to track the prices being given on New Holland round balers. Then we feature a classic Ford 871 on Ageless Iron. The shark farmer Rob Sharkey is back with his unique perspective on agriculture. And after these brief messages, Successful Farming's Advanced Technology Editor, Lori Bedord, investigates the technology behind food tracking. So please stay tuned. McDonald's is synonymous with burgers. It's also why the company believes it has a responsibility to ensure that the product it is delivering to its customers is produced in a more sustainable way. Yet, defining how sustainability is measured or demonstrated by beef producers throughout the different segments of the supply chain is a major challenge. To better understand every step of the journey from pasture to plate, McDonald's is teaming up with four organizations in a pilot project that will track the entire beef value chain. Sustainability is really important to McDonald's and has been for many years, especially in our beef supply chain. McDonald's is one of the largest purchasers of beef in the world, which makes it critically important to how we do business. And to do that, we really have partnered in collaboration with groups like Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef with multi-stakeholders that share that same vision and are looking to drive that sustainability improvement across the beef value chain. Collaboration is key to this project and, and really when we think about the industry as a whole and, and we kind of start thinking about a cow-calf producer. In the, in the industry, the cow-calf producer sells their calf and that information is, they don't know any more of the rest of the story of, of their product once it leaves their ranch. And so by bringing groups together in the whole value chain, we can learn from one another, we can share data both directions, frontwards and backwards, and actually make a better product. Each of the organizations involved in the project represent a different step in the beef production chain. Ranchers who are part of the Noble Research Institute's Integrity Beef Alliance will raise the cattle. The Beef Marketing Group, or BMG, will feed the cattle in one of their feed yards in Kansas. Our cow-calf producers that we're working with are involved in, are in a program called the Integrity Beef Program, um, which really is a set of best management practices that all of these producers are, are implementing in their place. So making sure that they have the right vaccination protocols in place, for instance, and so that bolsters animal health, and so hopefully um, that animal is better prepared when it goes to the feedlot. Additionally, all of the calves in this program are um, preconditioned for 60 days, and so again, trying to build towards better health when the animal goes to the feedlot, so it requires less antibiotics. We're not gonna feed this nation that's growing every day if we don't make improvements so that we're improving the product that we're making for our consumers. Everything we do is to make things better, and that's basically, to me, what sustainable is. If you're not looking forward at all times, you're gonna get left behind. There is so many times that people aren't getting the best out of their ranch. They're not getting the most out of their ranch. But when you look at the amount of land they have to use, if you start thinking sustainability, and if you th start thinking and caring about the soil, if you care about the grass, if you care about the water, if you care about your cattle, when you start making all those things better, you wind up doing more with less. All those things that you do right and that you learn to do better, you do them better and you will get rewarded. We are one segment in a beef value chain. So the beef value chain starts at the ranch level and that is where the cow is and the calf is born and then ultimately that animal, the calf will um, leave that ranching operation and come to the feed yard. And then ultimately we will take that animal and, and do the best we can to take them to the optimal finish weight and then that animal is harvested at a packing plant and disassembled and, and, and put into a product that's uh, consumable by the consumer. The reason the feed yard is so key, it deals with product quality. 
Um, we provide a very high energy, nutritious uh, ration here for the cattle that is overseen by a licensed nutritionist and and so the animals come and actually have a chance to have that high quality ration for a period of 150 to 200 days which allows for that marbling that our consumer likes so much to be deposited within the muscle and and actually helps the animal get to its optimal end weight sooner. Cattle will then be sent to Tyson Foods for harvesting. Some of the meat will go to Golden State Foods, which supplies McDonald's with some of their 100% beef patties served at its restaurants. As one of the collaborators, the Noble Research Institute will coordinate and provide management services for the two-year project. You know, we developed a project like this because, you know, really every bite of food has a story. So we wanted to bring everybody together to tell the, the full story of sustainability. Noble's role in the project is really looking at uh, sourcing the cattle with our integrity beef program and, the, and those uh, cattle producers, as well as then taking all the data, uh, synthesizing all the data from the full value chain and, and kind of bringing it together and synthesizing of what the direction is and then sharing that information back to the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef so we can help the whole industry. All participants are committed to documenting and sharing information from each phase of the production to increase efficiency and improve sustainability throughout the supply chain. Traditionally a cow-calf producer they may put in all these best management practices, but they don't get information back from the feedlot to say, how did my animal actually perform? What was the um, morbidity or mor mortality like? And so with this project, we're actually going to be able to track that. Um, we have EID tags in each animal, and so we'll be able to say, this animal got sick and it was administered these antibiotics, and we can trace that um, back to specific producers. For instance, if we have one group of cattle, that has gotten sick, we can go back and trace it back and see is there something that's going on at the cow-calf level that perhaps that we can change or modify that would then um, lead to better health at the feedlot. And so really that communication of information um, between these segments of the supply chain I think could really help lead us to having um, um, better health just within the whole industry, which would of course drive antibiotic use down. That this is about continuous improvement. And I think it's the same for a lot of our producers, whether they call it sustainability or not, it's continually improving. How can I be better? And so I may gather information, I may benchmark where I'm at today, but that's so I can look back and know where I was at and see, am I moving in the right direction? Am I improving? And what things do I potentially need to change? Because how do I know what to change if I haven't been tracking anything at all? Really the consumer is wanting to know where their food comes from. They're wanting to know the care and handling of the food, whether it be beef or vegetables. They really want to better understand what they're consuming. So this project is really going to allow us to do that because we've all taken sort of a commitment to transparency that, that not only are we going to share with the consumer what we're doing, we're going to verify it. So it's not about us just saying that we're using this much uh, of a resource, but we're going to measure it and we're going to be able to validate it. So I bought new lights for my shop. I bought the LED ones, right, that really light up. These things you hit the switch and all of a sudden it's like angels singing. White light is coming down from everywhere. I bring this up not necessarily for the lights, but where I bought them. I bought them off Amazon. And I find myself buying more and more off of Amazon. Even parts for the farm. And that's a change because we always had to do parts runs before. And we've all done them, right? We've all had that eight hour emergency part run that we had to make or else the entire farm was gonna shut down. In fact, we've all been through the, the five steps of the part run syndrome. First step being disbelief. I can't believe I can't find this part anywhere close. Second step is rage. Why wouldn't you keep this part in stock when everybody's gonna break it like I did? Then you go through depression. Oh, I've got to shut down everything to go run for a part so we can keep going. Fourth step is acceptance. Well, I guess I got to drive all that way for one stupid part. Then there's a fifth one. It's a cracker barrel. I don't know if it's really a step or not, but that's what we end up doing. And I don't even mind if I got to wait, you know, so we can go through the gift shop. You know, don't judge me. Getting parts online is different than it used to be. When you needed something, you went up and you saw the parts guy, Jim. You'd go up to the counter, you'd tell him what you broke, and Jim would go on the back and get it. But if he didn't, that wasn't bad either, because then you had time to talk to your neighbors, because they were in there drinking coffee or whatever. 
As these things change, so do our social interactions between farmers. Let's look at what used to be the biggest social interaction of all, which would have been farm sales. When a guy retired, he had a big farm sale and the entire neighborhood would come together. It was more of a social interaction. You'd reminisce about the great buys you got at farm sales in the past. You'd talk about what's going on in the neighborhood. But now it all seems to be consignment sales, which is fine, but it's a little less social. It's not the neighborhood getting together anymore. So what do we do? Do we actually go talk to our neighbors when we don't have a reason? That just seems weird. But the less time at the parts store and the less time at farm auctions, we might actually have to come up with excuses to go see our neighbors. I don't know, we could stop by and complain about their dog being on the road. You could stop by and remind him that your ditches are mowed and his aren't. <laughs> that always goes over well. The best is when a neighbor gets in the newspaper and then you can all kind of make fun of them. Or the one time the neighbor got in a magazine and we all really made fun of him behind his back. I can't even imagine if someone from the neighborhood actually got on TV. I'm Rob Sharkey, host of the Shark Farmer Podcast. You can find that podcast on sharkfarmer.com. You can find other stuff like this on agriculture.com slash TV. You think they're actually making fun of me? After these brief messages, I return with the sale of a late model New Holland 7070 round baler. So please stay tuned. If you have been considering upgrading your round baler to a unit with net wrapping, this New Holland BR7070 may be just the ticket. You see, this is a New Holland machine and it's one of the more popular round balers on the used market today, and for good reason. New Holland builds an outstanding line of round balers and offers them with a huge variety of innovations. So I expect bidding on this BR7070 to be brisk at today's consignment sale being held by Cook Auction. One of the reasons this baler will attract attention is that it is ideal for a farm that doesn't have much hay to put up, but which also has an older round baler that needs replacing. And the prices on this particular baler makes it affordable. Now this is a seven year old baler and it turns out four by six foot bales. The more sought after baler on the market produces four by five foot balers, but for its limited use, a larger baler could be put to work just fine on any type of farm if the price is right. And the price will be right for this baler as it is less sought after. Another advantage this baler provides is net wrap. So a farmer with an older baler that has only twine might want to upgrade to net wrap. Plus this baler includes a monitor. Now to get a handle on round baler values, let's go talk to Scott Cook of Cook Auction. We're talking to Scott Cook of Cook Auction about that New Holland, it's a 2012 New Holland BR7070. 70, 70, and that's a really popular baler. But it produces a four by six baler or bale and most guys are kind of buying four by fives. Will that depress the price on that today? Uh, not in our area. Four by six balers are real popular. Uh, number one, uh, for transportation, if you want to, you know, move it from, you know, if it's just going 50 miles, it's no big deal. But a lot of people haul hay several hundred miles. So a four by six will stack better and be legal going down the highway and not, they, that way they won't get bothered by the DOT. That's a 2012. Uh, it's shown some wear and tear, but uh, if I were going to size up that baler, what should I look for to say it's a good buy, or what should I look for for something that would scare me away from it? The first thing I always look at uh, when I'm buying balers to resell, uh, I always go to the belts, that's obvious, number one. Uh, two, I would always check the uh, pickup make sure the teeth are all still in there. Obviously a few of them could be gone with 7,000 rolls, that's kind of normal. Uh, chains and sprockets, obvious wear point, check it out. And just walk around the baler, get a good feel for how it looks appearance wise. A shedded baler will be normally a little bit better baler than one that sits outside. You have bearing issues that, you know, with the weather. Uh, one thing that I, I uh, it's kind of a trade secret, uh, I always try to go to the front of the baler and pull the belt away from the side of the baler and look into the chamber. And on that side, there's normally 
uh, carriage bolts that are right. on the inside of that baler, and they will show a lot more wear if they've baled a lot of hay. And so if you're questioning the amount of bale or amount of hay that's been through that baler, how many bales it's had run through it, if that carriage bolt is wore down, then you might be buying a baler with a few more hay bales that had run through it. You know, I have to ask about this because guys that have older balers have bought for a while. Don't all round balers have a counter on them? Well, uh, they all have a counter, but pr prior to, I think, the 90s, you know, it was just a clicker. Right. Now it's all computerized, so right. now they have them. So, you know, uh, you know, you take a 25-year-old baler, chances are, you know, you're guessing how many bales it's went through. But if you go into that chamber, check that bolt out, you'll be surprised. Oh, it'll verify It'll that. verify that it's, you know, it's not such a high-time baler. So if I, let's say I'm a couple states away and I'm really interested in that 7070, and I wanted more information, but I'm going to buy it online. Can I call you and ask for oh, your yeah. opinion? Yeah, you can call us anytime. We can, we'll go inspect it for you. Oh, We've okay. been doing it so long, we kind of know what to look for. Yeah. And we'll tell you whether you should buy it or not buy it. Now, if someone wants to get more information about your auctions, you have a monthly consignment auction except in July. I that think, is correct. Right. Where could they go to get more information? Uh, you go online, check it out. If you want any information on a specific piece, just call the office, ask for one of the sales guys, and we'll go look at it and check it all out for you. Well, thanks for that information, Scott. Let's watch that New Holland BR-7070 sell. So our BR7070 sold for just $9,500. How does that compare to other sales of similar balers? First, let's focus on recent auction prices. And I stress recent because sale prices that are four to five months old or older, frankly worthless as the marketplace has changed so much since that time. Now I found eight such balers have recently sold for $7,900 up to $16,000. The average price of these transactions was $12,500. For good measure, I researched dealer asking prices and dealers will often recondition a baler like this for resale, which adds values to the implement. Current dealer asking prices range from $14,000 up to $28,000. That wider dealer asking price is caused by the wide variety of attachments and upgrades available on round balers today. That's why it's crucial to get all the details about a round baler before bidding. The days are over when the only difference among round balers was whether they were used for string or net wrapping. You can get more information about baler prices and other used equipment prices by reading my Steel Deals report in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine and also catch my online auction reports at agriculture.com. For more information about Cook Auctioneers, go to their website at cookauctionco.com. I'll see you again next week on another Steel Deals report. After these brief messages, I travel to Iowa to talk to Tom Ogle about his love of classic Ford tractors. So please stay tuned. Our Aegis Iron Feature tractor this week is a Ford 871 owned by Tom Ogle of Grinnell, Iowa. And Tom, I have to ask you about this because it's always been confusing to me. You see 801 on the side. I knew there was the 801 series, mm -hmm. but this is an 871. Right. And there were four or five tractors in this series? Yes, the 801 was the series of the tractor. And this tractor has been restored and repainted, and that was the decal that was available. We couldn't find an 871 decal, which was the decal on here before it was painted. Oh, okay. But the middle digit on the Ford nomenclature indicated the transmission that the tractor had. And this one, and as an 871, had the 540 independent PTO with the selecto speed transmission. 
If it were an 881, it would have had 540 and 1000 and ground drive PTO with the selecto speed transmission. Now this tractor is kind of near and dear to your heart. This was your dad's tractor, right? Yes. My dad bought this tractor on a farm auction in 1960. Uh, might have been 61, but I was 12 years old at the time. And uh, he bought uh, this tractor. It had 375 hours on it. He gave $2,975 for it when it was two years old. And he bought the tractor, a three bottom plow, and a 10 foot mounted disc. And we always called this the Big Ford because we had a 641 that we pulled a two bottom plow with and a seven foot mounted disc, and that was the Little Ford. And this is a tractor you spent a little time restoring it too yes. over the years. Uh, my dad passed away about 20 years ago and the tractor was sitting in the machine shed. It hadn't been run for three years. Mm -hmm. And we started getting ready for a farm sale and I found out that the motor was stuck. And uh, I wanted to restore the tractor in the worst way. And, uh, but I thought, man, we put it on an auction and it's gonna go for a price, either for salvage or whatever. And so my mother went to my siblings. I have two brothers and a sister. And she said, I'd like to give the tractor to Tom. He'd like to restore it. So uh, mom said, I'd like you to have the tractor if you want it. And I said, sure. And so I brought it home and I pulled out the spark plugs and we poured stuff in the engine and I couldn't get it broke loose. Oh my. So I took it to Albia, Iowa to a Ford dealer down there. He'd, he'd been a Ford dealer once upon a time. And a gentleman by the name of Ed West is a service manager down there. And I said, when it looks like a new one, call me. <laughs> Well, when they started tearing the engine down, they had to push the pistons out of the block. It was stuck that tight, and they broke two of the pistons getting it apart. We put $2,400 in the engine and got the engine running. They said, well, there's this and this wrong with the transmission. I said, well, fix it. We put another $1,600 in the Selecto Speed transmission. And I knew it was weak because Dad had babied it along for a number of years. But we had four grand in this tractor before we started painting, before we started putting new tires on it, before we did a lot of that. It didn't make any difference. You're on the lookout for a TW? I would uh, buy a TW15 if the right one came along, if yeah. it was in real nice shape. I had a 15 once upon a time. Well, Tom, we'll see if we can help you out. So if you folks know of a good TW15 in good shape, Get a hold of Tom Ogle of Grinnell, Iowa. I'll see you again next week on another Aegis Iron Feature Tractor of the Week. Please join Jesse, Lori, and me next week for another show. In the meantime, be sure to visit the show's website at agriculture.com slash TV to get more information on this show and to view past episodes. And as always, let us know what you think of the show. Look for the show's email address at agriculture.com slash TV. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.